Um, so our next guest speaker, um, Christy Pushki is a natural foods advocate and author of Eating Additive Freed, Free, a natural cookbook and grocery shopping guide. Um, after resolving her own chronic health problems in 2007, Christy was inspired to help others reduce their reliance on processed foods. Through her website at completelynourished.com, Christy shares what she has learned about the dangers of processed food additives and teaches people how to shop for and prepare natural additive free foods. And I will just, I'm just getting my personal plug. I've known Christy for a long time and her food is amazing. Amazing. Her recipes are amazing. So that's all I'll say. Here you go. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> all right. So you guys are here to talk a lot about cooking today, right? And up until about five years ago, I had no idea how to cook anything. Can you hear me okay? And I had no interest, frankly, in learning how. What I liked to do was go out to eat. And I wasn't even going to quality restaurants. Any junk I could get my hands on that I didn't have to cook and do the dishes was fine with me. I was all about cheap, convenient foods. Frozen burritos, fast food, those were my kind of meals. That was until I discovered that eating that way really wasn't so cheap and convenient after all because it was destroying my health. Oh, sorry, technical malfunction. In 2002, I was 25 years old, just finishing up grad school, getting ready to launch my professional career, when I came down with what I thought was the flu. Is that better? I literally need to leave this on my chin. So, I had body aches, I was extremely fatigued, and I was really weak. But this went on not just for three to seven days. It went on for weeks and weeks, and I kept going back to my doctor. Eventually they ran tests for strep and for mono. They kept giving me antibiotic after antibiotic, and they just couldn't figure out what was wrong, and nothing they did for me seemed to help whatsoever. Over the next few years, my health really just kept deteriorating, and more and more symptoms evolved. Some of them were constant, and some of them would just come and go without any warning. I, any day I woke up, I never knew which symptoms I was going to be battling that day. So I'm going to share a few of them with you. This isn't even all of them, as hard as it is to believe. But just to give you a little glimpse into the life that I was living. I had widespread pain, kind of those body aches, just lingered on and on, and I just was in pain everywhere. I was very tender to the touch. It felt as if my whole body was bruised, basically. Any amount of pressure on my skin, even to lean against a wall like this, if I was having a bad day, I couldn't even do that. It would be too painful. I couldn't wear a bra, I couldn't wear a seat belt, because it would cause me too much pain. Many days, I was in so much pain, I couldn't even accept a hug from someone, not even from my own husband, who's kind enough to videotape today. <laughs> he remembers these days. He basically had his wife robbed away from him, and that whole in sickness and in health part of the wedding vows kind of came up a lot sooner than we had ever imagined that it would. I had troubles with insomnia. I would just wake up in the middle of the night, wide awake for no reason, could not get back to sleep. And probably as a consequence of that, I had this ongoing fatigue all of the time. Um, many days it would be all I could do to just get up, get out of bed, take my shower and get dressed. And by the time I did that, I was too exhausted to go and do whatever I had planned to go and do. So sometimes I was actually laid up in bed because I felt so crummy. I had irritable bowel syndromes. I'm sure many of you out there have had those kind of symptoms. And also an abdominal pain that felt like somebody was just stabbing a pole through my navel. And no one ever figured these things out. Again, I kept going back to doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist, and they would give me pain medications or an anti-seizure medication because that affects your muscles in a certain way that might help and give you some kind of relief. And nothing really ever worked. I had shooting pains, tingling, numbness, and burning sensations across my shoulders, down my upper arms, and up my neck. That eventually le led me to a neurologist, which I was really excited to go to that appointment, thinking that that's right up the neurologist alley, he's going to figure me out and send me on my way. Not that I wanted a neurological disorder, of course, but I just wanted an answer, and they couldn't figure anything out. I passed all their tests, all the blood work, nothing came back. The last one I'll mention, this is probably the worst symptom that I experienced, is I had this difficult to describe pain in my chest. For lack of a better description, it felt like somebody was scraping my lungs out with a razor blade. It was horrible. And that's the symptom that basically robbed me of my personality and really devastated me. Because if you know me, I'm a happy, bubbly, energetic person. I love to talk. That's why my mom named me Jabber Jaws, nicknamed me Jabber Jaws. 
And I just couldn't do it anymore. There were days where, at our house where I just had to, we had to implement a no talk day for Christy, which meant if you needed to ask me anything, I would have to answer you by writing it down on a piece of paper. Some days I would be in tears, just the pain I would have just from breathing, even if I wasn't talking. So life had become a struggle. Day-to-day -day tasks were awful, and some days I was just in complete misery. I remember sometimes I would be driving home from work, sobbing in the car because it was so painful and tiring for me to even hold my arms up and to be turning my neck and looking around to watch the traffic. And I would go past the hospital on my way home because that was on my route, and I would just think, maybe I should just stop in there. So many times I came this close thinking that if I just went in there, I might get one of those situations like you see on TV with the mystery diagnoses where you finally land at that doctor who knows he's seen something like you before and he knows exactly what to do. But then it would flash through my mind and logic would start setting in, or so I thought was logic, um, that I had already been to so many doctors and so many specialists, even a neurologist for crying out loud couldn't figure out why I had tingling and numbness. I'd been on countless prescription medications and they had done endless tests and diagnostics and found nothing. So I really kind of lost hope that anybody was going to figure anything out, and I just keep driving home. About a year after my initial symptoms developed, the doctors finally did find a diagnosis for me. They sent me to a, neuro a rheumatologist, and they diagnosed me with fibromyalgia, which didn't really do me any good because there was nothing that they could do for that. If you're not familiar, fibromyalgia is a complex of symptoms. So it's a group of symptoms that tends to co-occur together, but for which they don't have any single identifiable cause. The main symptoms of fibromyalgia are chronic widespread pain, which I definitely had, sleep disturbances, and chronic fatigue. So basically they told me, you know, we know you have these symptoms, but we don't know the cause, so we don't know why you have these symptoms. And there's really no viable treatments, so there's nothing they could do for me, and there's no cure. So they just prepared me for the medical fact that I would have to live with all of these symptoms for the rest of my life. All right, that's the end of the sad, sappy part. Now, <laughs> luckily, a couple of years later, which is now five years since my initial symptoms, I happened upon a book that changed my life forever. I forgot to mention also that I had resigned from my job by this point because I just couldn't handle going to work full time anymore. So I happened upon a book that changed my life forever, and I'm gonna tell you what the book is, but I'm not telling you to go out and get this particular book. It could have been any book about natural health would have given me the same information. But the book that it happened to be sitting at one of my relatives' house when I was bored waiting for my husband to fix their computer was Natural Cures They Don't Want You to Know About by Kevin Trudeau. So that's the book. Don't post that picture of me and Kevin somewhere. <laughs> Um, he actually outlines a, an entire health protocol in this book that we didn't necessarily adopt, but I'm just going to share with you the particular messages that we took from this book and made changes in our life. After I get a drink. All right. The first thing that kind of hit us hard was he talks about everywhere you look, you see people who are sick, tired, overweight, or in some sort of pain. And we've just gotten to the point where we, we think this is just normal. And it is normal because most people are feeling this way, but it's not natural. It means something's wrong. If you're not feeling well, something is wrong. And he talked a lot in his book about much of these, many of these problems stem from what we're putting into our mouths. And that really hit my husband and I pretty hard because we had never, ever looked at it that way. It makes such intuitive sense to me now, but I never gave any thought at all to what I was putting into my mouth. This was just five years ago. He also made a great point that you need to be your own health advocate. It's not the government's job, it's not the doctor's job, it's not the food industry's job. Granted, they're not always doing things to make it easy, but they're not worried about you, they're worried about them, so you need to worry about you. And that really struck me too, because I had always subscribed to the model, I guess, even without knowing it, I took my health for granted, thought when something went wrong, I just go to the doctor, he's my mechanic, and he'll just fix me up and send me on my way. And that had always worked for me, until now. So. Um, also, about being your own advocate, the food industry, it's not just the food industry, but the food industry is what we're talking about today, the regulations aren't as strict as you might assume. Once you start reading and digging, they're allowed to do things that aren't so great, which we'll talk about later. So you really need to do your own research and make sure that you know what you're putting into your own body. 
All right, so then he said, if you want to feel well, prevent cancer and other diseases, then you have to stop eating all this toxic nonsense that's in our food that didn't exist 100 to 150 years ago. Our bodies are just not designed to process the stuff like high fructose corn syrup, artificial sweeteners, MSG, trans fat, artificial colors, artificial flavors. I never knew that was in food. I never even knew there was something in food for me to think about. I didn't give any thought to it, but this book really opened up our eyes. And then sadly for me, he said, really the only way to make sure you're avoiding all that stuff is to cook your own food at home. <laughs> all right, you can imagine that was a pretty foreign concept to me and I didn't know how to make anything, so our diet was pretty boring for a while, right babe? <laughs> all right, so I decided I better start to learn how to cook. That was all this, everything in this book was a huge wake up call. I mean, he also talks about getting 15 clonics in 30 days and all sorts of other things I don't even remember because we didn't do. But those were the main points. And after I read this book, I started reading any book I could get my hands on that he referenced in here and any books that those referenced is. And I, and I was just enamored with this information. And a little plug for the library. <laughs> the library came in so handy because I didn't have to spend money and buy all these books. A lot of this information is available for free. You can research on the internet, you can get books from the library, you don't have to pay somebody. So, all right, I don't know what I, where I was going with that, but it was a wake up call. We realized that we had just been totally apathetic about what we were putting in our bodies. And then we realized, thanks to Kevin, that what we were eating really wasn't even food. We started scrutinizing the ingredients labels on everything in our kitchen, which we had never bothered to look at before, and we realized we did not know what any of those words meant. I don't know what polysorbate 80 is. I don't know what hexametaphosphate is, but that's what I was putting into my body. Things with ingredients list this long, which we'll get into more detail later. No worries. Um, actually, my husband, a few weeks ago, um, happened upon some boxes that we never un unpacked when we moved a couple years ago and there's receipts in here from 2003 from No Frills Supermarket. So these are kinds of the things that we were buying. Diet Mountain Dew. That was like food to us. That's what we lived on. Um, Totino's Frozen Pizza. Trolley Bright Crawlers, which is a gummy worm type thing. Jolly Ranchers. Sunkissed Soda Pop. Healthy Choice Frozen Meatloaf because when we weren't eating all the junk, sometimes we paid attention to what we were eating, but it was only if we wanted to drop a few pounds. And then we would look at the number of calories and how many grams of fat and carbs were in that box. That's as far as we looked on the ingredient information because that's what we thought it meant to be healthy. To be healthy was to just get a little skinnier. And to us, that was how you got a little skinnier. So we would eat those to kind of balance out the rest of this, which is bunny tracks, ice cream, brownie mix, chewy granola bars, Cheetos, frosted flakes, we don't have kids, by the way. This is what we were eating. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I cleared that up. All right, Apple Jacks, chicken pot pies, Doritos, Snicker bars, fat-free hot dogs, barf. Okay, so anyway, you get the point. That's the kind of stuff we were eating. We were just standard American junk food junkies. All right, got ahead of myself there. All right, so we read that initial book, kept reading all these other books, stopped eating things unless we could easily identify every ingredient as having come from a plant or animal in nature. That was rule number one. And within three months of making those changes, I realized all of those symptoms I talked about earlier were gone, totally gone. And not only were my symptoms of the fibromyalgia gone, I, we, but especially me, felt better and had more energy than pretty much anybody that I ever would meet. I didn't get tired in the mid-afternoon. I didn't need to take a nap. I never had stomach aches. I never had headaches. All the things you see, commercials for over-the-counter prescription medications on television, I never had any of that. Neither of us did. We never needed any of that again. We've never even purchased ibuprofen and aspirin and sinus pills that we used to live on all day because we just didn't need any of it anymore because we felt good. Not the good you see on TV, but the actual good, the way we should feel, where we don't need any of those things. All right. So as I'm going through the rest of this, I want you to keep in mind that it's not just the symptoms that I listed off that I had, or not needing the sinus medication. There's an endless array of health conditions that can be resolved by paying attention to what you're eating and getting the chemical ingredients out of your diet. I'm not a doctor or a medical professional, so I hope nothing I'm saying is being qualified as some kind of cure or something that I'm saying. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying, 
it makes intuitive sense that the closer you eat to the way nature intended us to eat, the healthier your body is going to be. So if you picture food choices along a continuum, in fact, with on this end we have prepackaged foods that are created in a factory somewhere, and on this end we've got whole natural chemical-free foods like the lettuce I grow in my garden, it just makes sense that the closer, I'm not saying you have to be 100% all the time or extreme, but the closer you get to this end, the better off your body is going to be. The other advantage of being on this end is that you're taking the power into your own hands. You're not relying on these companies and industries who have their own self-interest and profits as they would be expected to. That's what they have in mind, not your well-being. So you get over here, you're taking better control of your health. All right. So when I tell people that we've kind of scooted to this end of the continuum, a lot of times I get blank stares or like, well, what do you eat then? What do you eat instead? Which is what I thought too when we first read this book. So one tip, by the way, this is a side note, instead of, if you start thinking about changing your diet, instead of thinking about and longing for all the things that you can no longer have, like the Big Mac, for instance, just think about what foods are left. So that's what we did. We just concentrated, okay, what would qualify under these new guidelines that we're following? And we looked at those things and tried to figure out how we could combine them to make something good. We didn't sit around thinking, how can we recreate something as good as a Big Mac? If you think a Big Mac's good. Good luck. Because you think that Big Mac's good because of all the chemicals they're putting in there and because you're addicted and your taste pads are all jacked up because you're eating processed food. So you just kind of have to start over from scratch. But I want to give you a few, a little bit of insight into what we mean when we say that we're eating outside of the box, which is the title of this presentation kind of how it has affected our lifestyle and what are the particular changes that we implemented. These aren't in any particular order and we didn't do all of them at once necessarily. But the very first one I already discussed, we read every ingredients label and we still do. And if there's anything on there that we don't identify as coming from a plant or animal nature, we don't buy it, we don't put it in our mouth. So that's like the biggest thing. We buy certified organic foods whenever possible so that we can reduce our exposure to chemicals, pesticides, and herbicides. We, this was a foreign concept to me, um, we discovered there was such a thing as a farmer's market, which probably sounds crazy to all of you now, but even five years ago in Omaha we didn't have as many farmer's markets. So, and I really never understood, frankly, what it meant. And I didn't understand what organic meant, I just thought it meant like a lady in a bonnet picked it out of the ground instead of it coming from, I don't know what I thought it meant, but I had no idea that it meant that there weren't all these chemicals right on it. So we buy stuff from farmer's markets and then we also buy directly from farmers, which was a great way to save money, especially with meats, you can buy in bulk. Um, and so we've gotten to know the people who are actually raising the animal products that we're eating and the produce, but we grow a lot of our own. So. We've even gone out to a lot of their farms, which is yet another thing that was foreign to this city girl. And I've even had a few somewhat failed attempts at petting a cow, but that's, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> All right, so I kind of mentioned this, but we grow a lot of our own produce as well. We started the first year with a couple tomato plants, plants and pepper plants. Had no idea what we were doing. We thought you could just dig a hole in your grass and put it in there. It doesn't work. And now over these past few years, we have a huge, I mean, we have garden space, probably a combination nearly the size of this room here. So over time, over time, we've learned these things. But we wanted to be sure how our produce is being grown. And if you're doing it yourself, then you know if something's being sprayed on it or not and what's happening to it. We've even learned how to preserve some of it so that in the winter months, we can eat it later on by freezing it um, or even canning it, which was something I just thought grandmas did. But here I am. Even my husband does it. Actually, I gotta give him props because he pretty much does almost all of the cooking and canning and gardening nowadays, so thanks, babe. This probably goes without saying, but there's certain things we just stopped eating altogether, like fast food, we stopped drinking pop, and if you're wondering what we drink, we drink water. And we stopped chewing gum, we stopped buying candy, which I was a candy-holic. Um, literally, my husband would go to the hardware store and back then, not every hardware store had candy, but now they do. And he'd ask if I wanted to tag along, and guess what it depended on? Which one he was going to, because if they had milk duds, I was in. And if they didn't have candy, I would just wait for him at home. 
All right, so like I mentioned, we cook everything at home from scratch. Um, and don't feel sorry for us because we've figured out ways to make a lot of delicious things. Even this non-cook over here took a lot of practice. We had some, some meals we had to take for the team, as my husband says, so they didn't get wasted. <laughs> but we make homemade versions of you know, meatloaf and enchiladas and fettuccine alfredo and homemade versions of hamburger helper and chili and things that we're just making them all from scratch. We're not using little seasoning packets and stuff like that that you don't know what's in there. Um, for breakfast, I had to let go of my Fruit Loops and my Egg McMuffins, and now we make things like homemade oatmeal or scrambled eggs, fried eggs, fruit smoothies. And I had to let go of the Milk Duds and my addictive trips to Cold Stone, which was a good 20 minutes from my house. And I would sit at home, get an inkling for Cold Stone, rope him into going with me, and we'd literally leave our house just to go get ice cream and come all the way back. 40 minute round trip. So anyways, now we make our own treats and snacks at home from scratch. We make pudding, granola bars, cookies, ice cream, but we don't eat it all the time. Yeah. Candy. Candy. And candy. Well, chocolates, does that count? I'm not into the, like the thermometer on the stove and like, maybe, yeah, no. But yeah, we do make lots of good sweets, too many sometimes. And we make a lot of our own condiments, like homemade salad dressings, which are super easy to make. And if you had told me five years ago that I and even Chad would be making homemade mayonnaise, I would have told you to get lost. But we did. Um, and I don't want to be overwhelming anyone. So again, keep in mind this continuum that just the more you make choices that get you to this side, the better. You don't have to be 100%. We do because, as I'll explain later, I found out that I was acutely sensitive to some of these things and that's why I was having so many problems. So it's not worth the risk to me. We also take food with us. So if we know we're gonna be gone for the whole day at work or whatever, we pack a lunch. If we're gonna run errands for the morning or the afternoon and we think we might want a snack, we throw some nuts or apples or carrots or something in the car with us. And we've also learned to meal plan, which was a foreign concept to me. So we take a little time every week, think about what we wanna eat, make a list, make sure we'll have all the ingredients because we don't have that convenience, which again really isn't in the long run, of running to Burger King if we don't have something planned for that night. So we make sure we plan ahead. And we've also learned to embrace leftovers. To a lot of people, leftovers are a drag because that means you're eating the same old thing you had last night. But now they're like our salvation because it means we don't have to cook for an extra day. So sometimes I'll make enough food to bulk myself up for a few days so I don't have to cook. Well, now I have him home cooking, so I don't care. Um, and lastly, we do a lot more dishes. More specifically, he does a lot more dishes. All right. So after a year of adopting all these changes and feeling fantastic, I'm at work, because now I was working part-time, not my original job, and I realized I felt really crummy, and I had that lung symptom that I was telling you about earlier with the razor blade feeling, and I'm sobbing again on the way home from work, but this time it's because I'm devastated that my fibromyalgia is back. I get home, I'm telling my husband about this, I'm laid up in bed for the night, and he's just confident that I must have eaten something. It was so obvious to him. We've done this for a year, I felt fine, I must have accidentally ingested something, to which I replied, you know better, I take all of my own food to work. But at the time, I was working as a nanny, and I would do a lot of their grocery shopping, and I would buy things, versions of things that I knew that I could eat. So the next day, when I woke up feeling perfectly fine and my symptoms had completely dissipated, I thought maybe he's onto something. I was hoping he was onto something. So I go to work and I look through the pantry and I remembered that I had eaten some peanuts that I had purchased myself. So I turned the label around. It should just say peanuts, if they're the peanuts that I would be purchasing but it had a whole list of chemical additives, including monosodium glutamate, which is MSG, which we'll talk about. And I couldn't believe it, and I thought I would never buy these peanuts, and I'm very careful when I'm buying food, as you can imagine. So I talked to the mother, and what had happened is that I had purchased some, but they had already eaten through those. So she went to the store and bought the same brand, thinking she was getting the same thing. But I bought just the peanuts, which was just an unsalted peanut, she bought a reduced sodium version in the same brand. There's also a salted version. So compared to the salted version, when they reduce the sodium, so you're still looking for some sodium in there, right? 
they often, not always, they often add other chemicals to make up for the flavor that's missing by reducing the sodium. So that's what happened to me. And there was a several other times too throughout the next few years where I inadvertently ingested something in a situation like that. And then I got really mad. Up until this time, everything I had read, we had just applied it to our own life and I wasn't really worrying about everybody else. Um, but in my defense, I was <laughs> trying to learn how to cook and you know take care of all this new stuff I had been learning. But I really got mad because I thought, if one handful, one serving of peanuts could make me that sick that I was laid up in bed for the night, and thank God that's as long as it lasted because these things do wear through your system. The problem before is when everything I was eating had that junk in it, there's no chance for it to wear out of your system because you keep bombarding yourself. We'll, ex we'll get to more of that later. But it really made me mad and I started thinking, how many other people have headaches or arthritic pain or diarrhea or whatever, and it's because of the same problem that I just had. So I kind of started on a crusade to inform as many people as I could about these hidden additives and the sneaky tactics that the food industry uses, which we'll get to in a second. All right, so I'm sure many of you are aware of some of this, and maybe that's why you're here, and maybe several, many of you are already doing your best to kind of avoid some of the additives I was talking about, like the corn syrup and the MSG and all that, and maybe you're even spending you know, a lot of extra money to go to some place like Whole Foods or another natural health market. But chances are you're still being tricked by some of these super sneaky tactics, which I promise we're gonna talk about in just a second. <laughs> All right, so what are these sneaky tactics? One of them, MSG is what we're gonna really focus on, but I just wanna mention a few others first. One of them is the word natural. So. Like I talked about, it just makes intuitive sense that the more naturally, naturally we eat, the better off our body's gonna be because that's what we're designed to process. Well, the food companies realize that y'all are onto them and you don't wanna be eating all these chemicals and man-made things and you don't trust them so much anymore. And they know you wanna eat natural things, okay? An apple is natural, but they can put the word natural on the front of any package. It's not a regulated term, so it doesn't mean squat. Just ignore that. That goes for any claim on the front of a package. Just ignore it and look what's in the ingredients list. So that's, that's one big one. Um, as a side note, the good news about that is that it means the food industry is responding to consumer demand. I mean, unfortunately, in that case, they're just tricking us and letting us think we're getting what we want. But they do catch on to the trends of what people are actually looking for in food. So Ultimately, the power is with us because if we have enough people demanding good, real food, then that's what we're gonna find in the products that we wanna buy. So I'm not just informing other people for their sake, it's a selfish venture too because I'm worried that when I'm 80, there's not gonna be any food in the grocery store. It's gonna all be tricks and Reese's peanut butter cups like I used to eat, so. All right, that's that. Another thing I just wanna make sure you know is that because we didn't realize this at first, is that just because you shop at a natural foods market or an organic market or a health food market or the product says that it's organic or natural doesn't mean that there cannot be chemical additives in there. So no matter where you're shopping and no matter what you're buying, you still have to look at the ingredients list. All right, um, another thing the food industry does is they kind of deceive you with the pictures they use. For example, if you buy eggs at the grocery store, or even you enter the dairy department at some grocery stores, you see that picture of the, the cute farm with the green grass and the red barn. Anyone ever looked up where animals really come from at the grocery store? Because it doesn't look anything like that place in the picture. Uh, trans fat. Anybody out here know about the trans fat? You want to avoid it? It's linked to cardiovascular disease and such. All right. Um, and maybe many of you know this. This one's come out in the news a bit. That if you're trying to avoid trans fat, you want to make sure how many grams of trans fat are in that product. Anyone? If you don't want to eat trans fat, how many grams would you want? Zero, that's right. So just for example here with this delicious tuna helper Italian fettuccine alfredo, you don't want trans fat, so you look on here and it's labeled trans fat zero grams. But according to labeling laws, they can put zero as long as there's less than 0.5 grams of trans fat per serving. I could eat this whole box, first of all. But anyway, so, um, 
If you really want to know, then you need to look at the ingredients list and look for partially hydrogenated oils. All right. So it's just deceiving. It's tricky. Zero equals zero. Zero doesn't equal 0.498. And if you eat several servings of that, and then for dinner you eat several servings of something else, and then for dessert, and all these things say zero, and they all have 0.49, it's going to add up, right? All right. So like I mentioned, the additive that ticked me off the most was the MSG. Because that's what really started making me realize that that might be where my health problems had come from. And when I started reading about it, I learned that it's hidden on ingredients labels under dozens and dozens of other names. All right, let me start at the beginning here. So MSG stands for monosodium glutamate. And maybe many of you know that, maybe you don't. But the reason it's important is because, again, the food industry knows that people are looking out for MSG. You sometimes see signs at Chinese restaurants, or maybe you've heard about it, in connection with Chinese food or the Chinese restaurant syndrome, which is basically that people have heart attacks after eating Chinese food, sometimes right there in the restaurant after they're done dining. And it's linked to this high dose of MSG that they're using in the food. So the food industry knows that people are looking out for MSG and they don't want MSG. So, at the very least, they often just write it out. Monosodium glutamate, because a lot of people aren't clued in that that's the same thing. That is MSG, what it stands for. But even worse than that, they can put no MSG on the front of a package, and it could contain one, two, three, five, seven of these other ingredients that contain this MSG product, which I'll explain in a minute, on the back. So you're getting the same exact thing, and they're able to say that. So, that one really, really made me mad. The thing with MSG, monosodium glutamate, is that it's the glutamate part that is actually the problem. That's what causes health problems. It's an excitotoxin. It overstimulates your taste buds, which is what makes food taste good. That's why they put it in there. It's a flavor enhancer. But it also disrupts your nervous system. And according to doctors like board certified neurosurgeon Russell Blaylock, MD. He's got a couple books out. This one, Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills, I recommend everyone read that. It's a very scientific read, but um, it's a really good resource and goes into a lot of detail of exactly what this stuff does in your body and what kinds of symptoms it can be linked to, which I'll mention a few of in a little bit here. Um, but anyway, it, so it screws up your health. It also um, intensifies pain signals just in general. So if you're in any kind of pain, eating things like MSG can exacerbate that, even if it's not the, uh, the original cause. All right, sorry, I bounced all over and now I lost where I, what I wanted to say. All right, so they use MSG as a flavor enhancer. The glutamate's the problem, and I'll tell you about all the hidden names in a minute. So if they want to make something taste good, for instance, chicken broth. Back in the day, I'm just making up this example, but... <laughs> If they wanted to make a pot of chicken stock this big that would taste really good and you would want to eat it, say they would have to use 10 chickens to make it taste really chickeny and delicious, all right? Well, then along comes MSG, and they can save money now because they could use one or two chickens, taste it, it tastes like water basically, sprinkle some MSG in there, and now it tastes more chickeny. MSG doesn't have a, really a flavor of its own. It just enhances the flavors of whatever you're putting it in. Does that make sense? All right, so they're doing it to save you money. It doesn't need to be in there. If you make chicken stock at home, you don't sprinkle MSG in there, hopefully. Um, if you use accent seasoning, by the way, that is MSG, just so you know. Look at the back. All right. So this glutamate thing. There's many hidden names, and I have a packet for you up here when you leave if you want to grab one. And one of the sheets is, first, some of the common symptoms of MSG, um, which were taken from Dr. Ray, Dr. Russell Blaylock's book and other books as well. And I'll just read off a couple for you. Great. Anything I already mentioned counts. Those are, all, those are all on this list, all the problems I had. Depression, anxiety, panic attacks, hyperactivity, especially in kids, aching teeth, seizures, tremors, migraine headaches, vision problems, irritable bowel, acid reflux. This list goes on and on and on. I didn't even read a third of them. But, so make sure you take that when you go. And there's also a sheet in there about the hidden names for MSG. Like I said, there's dozens and dozens of other ingredient names that have MSG. 
the glutamate part of MSG, which is the neurotoxin that causes all of the MSG health problems. But like I said, people are just looking for MSG. They don't realize that it's the glutamate part of MSG that's the problem. So the manufacturers, sometimes if they're smart, they don't even use the monosodium glutamate. They just set that to the side and start using things like autolyzed yeast extract or guar gum or natural flavor and put that instead because so many people don't realize that has glutamate in it. Does that make sense? Does everyone follow that? Because that's kind of like the crux of all this. All right, so some of the hidden names, which this is also in the packet, hydrolyzed vegetable protein, yeast extract, caramel flavoring, broth, bouillon, modified food starch, citric acid, stored spices on ingredients label where they don't list out the actual spices. You can't assume that that's just a little bit of garlic and oregano. And sometimes you'll even see garlic, oregano, paprika, spices. They don't have to tell you what's in the spices. Same thing with natural flavor. You don't know what's in the natural flavor. And it's a long story, but glutamate ultimately does come from nature because they can extract it from things like seaweed and molasses. But what they're doing to it is so unnatural and they're giving it to you in such a concentration that your body cannot handle it. All right, so make sure you get that packet. I feel like I've skipped pages or something. Maybe I'm just talking fast. All right, so I just brought some examples, not from my home pantry. I actually went out and bought this stuff. I should have asked for donations, but I gave yet some more money to these food companies. Um, but I just brought some examples so you can see what I'm talking about when you go to the grocery store and where some of these things are hidden. And most of these things here, as you'll see, actually have the pure monosodium glutamate in them. One last thing about that. The glutamate that's the problem Monosodium glutamate is 78% glutamate. So those other words that I told you about, they have a lesser dosage of glutamate in them, but sometimes they'll put three, four, five, six of them in a single product. So you're still getting a big hit of glutamate. And if you're really sensitive to it, like I've found out that I am, I can't even eat a smidge. I mean, if you wanna know if there's hidden glutamate in there, you just give it to me and I'll let you know tomorrow. All right, so when I'm telling you to eat, you know, more on this side of the continuum, you would probably guess this would be something you would not choose. So it has the trans fat hidden issue, like I already talked about. It also has pure monosodium glutamate. And like I mentioned, this is what I'm saying, how there's plenty of other hidden MSG words too, like yeast extract, spice, natural and artificial flavor. Those are all in here. And those are just the MSG words. There's other additives in here too, like corn syrup, hydrogenated, partially hydrogenated oil. I already mentioned that. All right, so you don't want to eat this, but it's easy to reinvent, recreate these things in your kitchen from simple whole ingredients too. Yogurt, <laughs> back to the picture thing with the eggs in the container. They do it on this stuff too. So you see bananas and strawberries on the front, right? You're gonna get a little bit, a little bit of your daily fruit intake, but there's no fruit in here. If you look closely, it says, creamy strawberry banana flavored. So there's not bananas and strawberries in this particular variety, they just put some natural flavor in there to make it taste like there is. The other thing about yogurt is, I've actually met a lot of people who, they hate yogurt, but they are choking it down because on TV it says that yogurt is good for them. And I'm not saying that no yogurt is good for you, but they're getting any old yogurt. And unbeknownst to them, they're choking down this serving of high fructose corn syrup, artificial colors, and fake flavoring. All right. So that's that. Chicken noodle soup. This is Campbell's wholesome chicken noodle soup. Heat that up when you're sick. That's what I used to do. Has monosodium glutamate in it. Also has other hidden names of, of the glutamate, like modified food starch and yeast extract, and the just generic word flavoring. All right, you wanna stay away from words like that because Again, you're back on this side of the continuum trusting the food industry that whatever they're whipping up in their lab is okay for you and they're not even telling you what the heck is in it. Um, and also the first ingredient is chicken stock. And the thing with chicken stock and chicken broth on food labels is, how many of you have ever, ever made broth or stock at home? Okay, is there multiple ingredients in there? Yeah. But on here it just says chicken stock or chicken broth and they don't tell you what the heck is in it. So you remember the broth I was making earlier? How do you know which one is in there? You don't. All right, so maybe you say, okay, Christy, I will buy my own vegetables, chop them up, get some meat, maybe some rice and noodles, 
and I'll make my own soup out of this chicken broth. Same problem. This one says 100% natural on the front. Again, that doesn't mean anything at all. It also says no MSG added, which isn't true because they're referring to the health problems of glutamate, and so it matters to you if there's glutamate in there. MSG, you don't really, it doesn't really matter whether it's MSG or autolyzed yeast extract. And then they're kind enough to tell you, well, there's no MSG added, but there is a small amount of glutamate that occurs naturally in yeast extract, and we did put some of that in here. They don't even always bother to tell you that. I don't know, maybe they got called out on it or something. So yeah, there's yeast extract in here. And again, that broth that you don't know what's in it and natural flavoring. All right, so forget the soup, right? Let's just make a stinking salad, chop up some lettuce and some vegetables and get some salad dressing. Pretty much any salad dressing you buy at the grocery store has at least something in it. Xanthan gum, they use to thicken and stabilize salad dressings and that's on the hidden glutamate list. Um, but this one I picked because it's an especially bad culprit. <laughs> it has monosodium glutamate in it. Uh, also has natural flavors, that vague word spices, um, artificial flavors, modified food starch, which is on the MSG list. So you want to stay away from that. But it's really easy to make your own dressings at home. All right. So maybe for breakfast, you forget, forget about the Fruit Loops. You're going to make some homemade pancakes. You put a little butter on there, which that can have stuff in it, like natural flavor. Um, and then you get some syrup to dump on there, because syrup's just syrup, right? Syrup comes from a tree. They put it in a bottle and send it to the grocery store. That's what I always assumed. But when you see just syrup or pancake syrup, and it doesn't say maple syrup anywhere on there, it's actually coming from a cornfield. So this is high fructose corn syrup cellulose gum, caramel colors, sodium benzoate, sorbic acid, artificial and natural flavors, and sodium hexametaphosphate. I just love the word. No idea what the heck that is. All right, peanut butter. You'd think peanut butter would be a pretty basic ingredient. When I buy peanut butter, I look for peanut butter that just has peanuts in it. This is Skippy reduced fat peanut butter. It has peanuts, which is great, and it should stop there. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the list of ingredients right here has corn syrup solids, protein, soy protein, which is also on the list, hydrogenated vegetable oils, which they're just putting in there, by the way, so that you don't have to stir it. When you buy natural peanut butter, the oil separates up to the top naturally. You stir it once, stick it in the fridge, and you're golden. Or if you want to leave it in your cupboard, you can buy this, where they're just adding hydrogenated oils so you don't have to stir it. It's crazy. All right. Lipton onion soup mix. When I didn't know how to cook, I could at least cook a meatloaf or my mom's roast recipe by dumping this into a pot with some meat. Little did I know it has MSG, monosodium glutamate. It also has corn syrup, has onions and onions powder, which is great. I can make my own homemade version out of some dry onion flakes, onion powder, garlic, and some salt. I don't need to put MSG in there. Tastes just fine. Same thing with taco seasoning. This is full of monosodium glutamate and other random things like these aren't additives, but I'm just saying there's like wheat flour in here. I don't understand. And sugar and my taco seasoning doesn't need to have that. But there's definitely MSG in here, which you don't want. And the peanuts, as we already talked about earlier, when you buy peanuts, you could find some that are just peanuts. And that's what I would buy. Or maybe peanuts and some salt. This just says planters dry roasted peanuts. And they just look like peanuts. They're not any funky color or anything weird. Dry roasted, so there's not even going to be any oil. Sounds really healthy. And these packages actually used to have a little stamp on the front that said, with sea salt. So then you really thought it was healthy, right? Too bad when you turn it around, it has peanuts, sea salt, sugar, cornstarch, monosodium glutamate, gelatin, terulu yeast, corn syrup solids, paprika, onion, and garlic, and spices, like I was saying earlier, and natural flavor. What for? To make it taste so good you can't stop eating them, <laughs> so you have to buy more. Yeah, what for is right, and you would not think, based on the front of this package, that all that garbage in there. Um, the applesauce I have up here, because it has high fructose corn syrup in it, um, but you can find applesauce that's just apples. Sour cream, what should be in sour cream? Anyone know? Sour cream, sour cream, cream that's been cultured. That would be fine, too. Um, the first ingredient here is milk. So that's a bad sign, because if you know about milk, you get like this much milk in a half a gallon compared to this much cream when you milk a cow. Cream's a lot more expensive, but it's a lot thicker, right? 
So if they're starting with milk, they're going to have to do something to make this thicker. So they've got milk, then cream, modified food starch, which is on the list, sodium phosphate, guar gum and carrageenan, which are on the list, sodium citrate, locust gum. Yeah, you can find ones that are just sour cream, as you know, tomato paste. All right, if you're buying tomato paste, you're probably making something from scratch for sure, right? So maybe you're going through all this trouble to make your own pasta sauce or something. You want to look for one that's just tomato paste. Many of them have at least natural flavor in there for some reason. But it'll say on the back, so just take a look. This particular one is an Italian herbs variety, but that still doesn't excuse about all the things I'm about to tell you are in here. Maybe some oregano or something would be expected, but this is um, tomato paste, high fructose corn syrup, dried onions, partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, which is that trans fat, spices, hydrolyzed corn gluten, soy and wheat gluten proteins, and then some cheese and some other flavors and some yeast and some soy flour. That's in here. Like, I don't know if there's this much tomato paste in there or what. All right, so that's that. I think we're to the last one. This is canned tuna. And there's whole other issues about canned foods and buying wild caught meat and all that. But I'm just talking about the labels at this moment. So this is white albacore tuna in water. So what, what would you logically conclude is in here? Tuna and, water. tuna and water, right. So some tuna comes packed in vegetable oil. So they're distinguishing here that this one isn't. It's in water. Then you flip it around. Tuna, water, vegetable broth. Which if you remember the broth, okay, yeah. And why is it even in there? Yeah. All right. So that's that. And that's, this, this could have been my pantry five years ago. These are all things that I typically ate. And if your diet looks anything like the things that I used to eat, then I hope that I've empowered you at least a little bit today to start doing some of your own research and being a little more conscious about what you're putting into your body. I'm not a doctor, like I said. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm just a person who got my health back from doing my own research and following a path that just seemed to make intuitive sense to me. Learning how to cook truly gave me my life back. And it really breaks my heart to think about that there are other people out there who are just giving up and assuming that they're gonna live in a life of misery just like I had done because that's the only answer anyone has ever given them. No one should have to live like that. Everybody should sleep well, feel great, and have all the energy they need to do everything that they wanna do. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, yeah, like I think Amy mentioned, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a book, it's through my website, it's called Eating Additive Free. There's 160 recipes in there and a grocery shopping guide in the back.